Once there was an age when thousands around the world flocked to Nickelodeon parlors, theaters, and picture palaces to witness what was to them a new miracle. For this was the time of the birth of the cinema, the motion picture, the very beginning of the first truly mass entertainment industry. That's the word a director shouts just before the camera starts turning. Action is the very essence of the movies, and there is something inherent in the medium that compels it to seek out violent spectacle. Even when the movies were young, many a filmmaker in Britain, France, United States, all of which began about the same time, uh, artfully staged uh, scores of brawls, battles, sieges, and so on and the camera always found them absolutely irresistible. This film, produced by 1894, is believed to be the earliest known movie made that we can still see today. It shows, however, an all too familiar theme. Some men standing at a bar, one starts an argument, and soon, fists are flying. Aggression, violence, a fight, the harsh ingredients of what is probably the oldest movie in existence. This two-minute quickie was simply called Barroom Scene and was produced by the great American inventor Thomas Edison, hailed by many as the father of the cinema. Even then, the pioneer filmmakers showed a common touch and sensed the likes of the mass public. But what kind of a world was it in those days when the cinema was really young? For once, it was a relatively calm place. The United States was a nation forging ahead. Thousands of immigrants a year arrived at the port of New York heading west, but barely lingered in the city's muddy streets. In Britain, Queen Empress Victoria reigned supreme. Her empire covered one quarter of the Earth's surface. And many felt, as they enjoyed the fun of the fair, that they were destined to grow richer at every turn. In France, the Third Republic, too, was feeling rich, content, and comfortable. In 1900, they mounted the Great Paris Exhibition. In his day, the envy of the world, and thousands flocked to see it. The new German Empire was beginning to make the world tremble by displays of what the Kaiser called the male fist. Italy, also recently united into one nation by Garibaldi, was Europe's envied museum. It was a world far different from today's, one in which the internal combustion engine was hardly noticeable and the century of the common man only about to dawn. The early filmmakers recorded this age for all to see, but when Queen Victoria saw a film of her 1897 jubilee, she remarked, it is a pleasure to have seen such a marvel, but rather tiring on the eye but her eyes were growing old and feeble. And in 1901, the old widow of Windsor died. And so did the relative calm. So off they went to battle with Boers, Boxers, Zulus, Spaniards, Mahdi's, Mexicans, and so on. Violence was in the air. And the filmmakers, sensing the atmosphere of the times, catered to the public, and in doing so, created the war movie. The 
Boxer Rebellion in China moved a leading British filmmaker of the day, James Williamson, to make Attack on a China Mission. This dramatization portrays a gallant British missionary defending his home and family from the murderous boxers until the timely arrival of the Royal Navy. Also in 1900, another British producer completely staged a mock execution sequence for a short film. Like the attack on a China mission, it was so realistic that audiences thought they were seeing the real thing. British filmmakers clung to newsworthy events and tales of colonial exploits. In 1906 came How a British Bulldog Saved the Union Jack. This drama depicts a fanciful episode from the Zulu Wars. Photographed some 4,000 miles from Africa and complete with a circus-trained horse, the action is as subtle as the film's jingoistic title. America around 1910, the publicity men said they were making the first real movies. <laughs> and here, filmmaking blossomed into an industry. Production moved from cramped eastern studios to spacious, sunny Southern California. Here they could film as never before, and along came a host of companies to turn out two real dramas by the score. Along to California came cameramen, writers, producers, directors, actors, men who set an incredible creative pace. Unlike the old states of Europe, Americans had only a few recent wars to restage for the cameras, so they dug back into their own not uneventful past. In 1909, J. Stuart Blackton, working for the Vitagraph Company, made a series called Scenes from True Life, a fearless title if ever there was one. Here he features the American War of Independence. The film lumps several items together. Firstly, the melodramatic end of brave Lafayette. Then the surrender of Lord Cornwallis, the event that ended the war. Finally, an addendum to the story. Washington, asleep, imagines a new, more prosperous and powerful America. Could this an early vision of New York City rising shakily upwards be the first of many Hollywood-inspired American dreams? In the United States at this time, the movie's first truly powerful talent emerged. This aristocratic-looking young man is David Wark Griffith, the world's first great film director. Griffith, a one-time salesman, hop picker, poet, and day laborer, broke into movies via script writing and acting. One of his first jobs was with the Biograph Company, and within a few months, he became their principal director. Griffith formulated the basic grammar of film and became its first master. Throughout his early formative years, he worked alongside this man, Billy Bitzer, Hollywood's first great cameraman. In 
In 1911, a mere three years after he began directing, Griffith, with Bitzer on camera, made this film, The Battle. It starred Charles West and the popular Blanche Sweet. It tells a tale of love and strife set during the American Civil War. Griffith had a great narrative sense. The publicists called him <laughs> the Shakespeare of the screen, and there was scarcely a subject or a form he did not attempt. He usually featured family honor, the siege, and the last minute rescue. All these were, were Griffith staples. The battle contains all three. Here, Billy's comrades are under attack, outnumbered and low on ammunition. Billy is sent to bring back vital supplies. En route, the convoy is ambushed. Single-handedly, Billy saves the day. thanked by the wounded general. But here, a, a typical Griffith touch, for amidst this um, official adulation, our hero still manages to blow a kiss to his lady love. A year later, Griffith took his cameras to New Jersey, back east, to film this melodrama, Viewed in the Kentucky Hills. Following the violent quarrel between two families, the hostilities commence. The film featured a fresh-faced 18-year-old actress who was eventually to become known as America's Sweetheart. Her name, Mary Pickford. Again, typical Griffith elements. Family honor, a siege drama, and so on. They provide the framework for the story. Viewed in the Kentucky Hills derives its impact from violence and slaughter. 
as cousins, kinfolk, brothers, fathers, mothers, and so on, are swept into the conflict. Again, a happy ending as the hero and the heroine, having been spared, walk off into a Kentucky sunset. Back in Europe, a vital filmmaking force, the Italians, had brought their productions to a lavish and spectacular peak. In 1913 came Cabiria, the most acclaimed film of that era. Cabiria ran for well over four hours, an unprecedented length for a film in those days, and is set in Caesarean Rome. It romanticizes the adventures of a lady of court and her genial, strong manservant, a homebred Tarzan called Machiste. Cabiria was directed by Giovanni Pastroni. He was a revolutionary filmmaker, and on this Italian war epic, no expense at all was spared. The film set new heights in film technique. The model work on this sequence of the burning of the Roman fleet was thought outstanding. In America, Hollywood has become the hub of a major industry and by 1912, Total production exceeded 500 films a year. One of those films was made by the Edison Company, people who'd been in movies from the very beginning, and titled The Charge of the Light Brigade. Off goes brave Captain Nolan to halt the charge. But all in vain. Director Cyril Dolly skillfully related the tragic story of Tennyson's miscounted 600 and the bungled order leading to the suicidal charge of the Light Brigade at Balaclava. The film was an instant success. And six months later, Dolly filmed another chunk of Britain's imperial past, the relief of Lucknow. Now, here's the tale of how the Indian town of Lucknow, property of the British Raj, was put under siege during the Indian mutiny of 1897. The hero of the piece volunteers to run the gauntlet for much needed aid. He disguises himself as an Indian, hides the vital message under his turban, kisses his lady goodbye, and flees the fort. The safely delivered message soon brings the Highlanders to relieve the garrison and put down the mutineers. As with all war films of this period, there was no hint of hatred, life under the sword, cartridges smeared with pork fat and or of social injustice. The seeping wound an artist calls a conscience was to appear on celluloid a short while later, irritated by what was to happen next, the year 1914. The spheres of influence, legitimate aspirations, and the great game had all materialized into bloody, stagnant, trench warfare. 
Newsreel film coming back from the front quickly stifled the romantic image of war, the way producers have been recording it for nearly 20 years. In Europe, filmmaking came to a virtual standstill, but in America, production surged relentlessly on towards what some have termed the golden age. D.W. Griffith, seen here directing, made two mighty epics, A Birth of a Nation and Intolerance, the latter being a massive attack on hypocrisy through the ages a singular vision of man's inhumanity to man. Then in 1916, another film was to emerge and prove as powerful as anything yet seen. This film, which has been practically forgotten today, was grandly called Civilization and was made by producer-director Thomas Ince. Ince was one of Hollywood's most accomplished filmmakers. Like Griffith, he came to films via the theater and worked briefly for Griffith at Biograph, where he directed his first film. Such was his remarkable energy that within four years, Ince had his own studio and considerable power. He became one of Hollywood's first creative producers, and all his films, whether he wrote, directed, or edited them, bore his own stamp. Exhausted by a decade of intensive work, Ince died, mysteriously, as the papers put it, in his late 30s. To Hollywood and the film world, it was a premature death, but civilization remains a remarkable legacy. The film took a hitherto unparalleled look at the violence of war. And this pacifist movie, set in an imaginary European country, made America, a nation which at that time was full of isolationist sentiments, acutely aware of the hostilities raging across the Atlantic. Guts heroics here, but images of total war on land and sea. The futility of battleship bashing it out against battleship, not to mention the breakdown of family life and the disruption of society. Civilization was released during the election year of 1916, and the American Democratic Party credited the film with helping to re-elect President Woodrow Wilson on a keep-us-out-of-the-war ticket. And it's small wonder that after America did enter the war in 1917, the film was asked to be withdrawn for reasons of national morale. A mere 20 years separates Edison's barroom brawl movie from Thomas Ince's Civilization. And that was a period during which the new medium discovered that it could not only entertain, but also move minds and influence behavior. During these early amazing years, the cinema came of age. It was a force. Difficult to calculate, but surely one to be reckoned with. 